Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 509. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. A proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on the network, please go ahead and visit their site, evergreenpodcast.com. So this week's interview is with Ben Renshaw. Ben is a leadership thought leader, doing keynote speaking and coaching on leadership and purpose-led cultures. He's author of several books and notably his last book, which was co-written with my friend Sophie Devonshire, Love Work, The Seven Steps to Thrive at Work. In this conversation with Ben, we discuss his atypical background as a classically trained violinist, his work in leadership, and how to chart one's path and find purpose at any age. We talk about the notion of love at work and how to bring about positive work experiences, improving engagement, and how to thrive in life and at work. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. And if you have a little moment, please go ahead and drop in a rating and review. And don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Ben Renshaw, great to have you on my show. Uh, there's nothing like having someone who is an author. You've been a many times best-selling author and a musician. So let's start with who is Ben? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> um, well, look, in, in terms of dimensions of Ben, I'll, I'll give you um I'll give you kind of the the potted history and then so yeah, look, I, I did start life out as a classical violinist so my in fact my father ran a little music school called the Yehudi Menuhin school which is nestled in the beautiful countryside of Surrey just outside London it's a very niche environment there's like 45 children from all over the world who are the top musicians and I happened to play the violin um but I had no when well, my father took the job it wasn't about you know his children going to this school but actually, my violin teacher also taught the violin at the school and suggested that I audition. I auditioned. I got in. And at that age, my friends were at the school because it's a little boarding school. And and I, I but I had this kind of a real conflicted relationship with music because I was very good, um, but it wasn't my passion it wasn't my in fact my passion was sport and I wanted to be a professional footballer but I didn't have the talent but I had the talent for music I also didn't enjoy academia so there was a very conscious trade-off for me I'm going to stick with the violin that means if I fail all my exams it's fine because I've got the violin I did scrape through my exams but then I I then took a gap year and as a, as a musician you don't take gap years you just keep practicing and I mm -hmm. but I started traveling and I went and lived on a little kibbutz in Israel in the in the desert and that really began to open my eyes there's more to life than the violin then I went to America and I worked on a summer camp very creative environment there and I I, I really got the love of travel and freedom and different cultures and I came back to London and I started at the what's called the Guild Hall School of Music and Theatre at the Barbican. And in two Activistically, weeks, you felt like you had to go keep on the music, even yeah, though... Yeah, yeah. And, but after two weeks, I'm, I'm out of here. I This is not... I, I It really cemented I'm not a, an organisational animal and I need to get out of here. But again, it threw up the very existential, existential question for me of, well, I knew what I didn't want, but I didn't know what I did want. And so that started my real questioning around my sense of why and, you know, what, what's my real sense of purpose here and what am I looking for? And that led me down into two areas that I was very clear about, which were people and problems. And I thought if I put the two together, I'd be happy. So essentially, you know, I set myself up as a problem spotter. And people would come to me, they would tell me about the problems they knew they had, I would tell them about the problems they didn't even know they had yet. And it was a great working relationship. And I went to America, did a lot of stuff there, came back here. And I had a few incarnations. I, I started out in the field of relationships, and I actually became known as kind of the relationship expert in this country. I was kind of the new man. It was pre-reality TV, and I did a lot of 
TV on dating shows and a show called Perfect Match. And, and then with a colleague, I set up something called The Happiness Project. So we looked at positive psychology and that was on the back of the, the NHS and working with health professionals. We then got invitations into organizations. And the first company I started with was British Telecom in the mid 90s. And so that, that was good to of, talk. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I ran a whole campaign for them on agile business, balanced life back in the 90s. <laughs> as BT. they were, like, yeah, as they were landing, you know, a digital age back then. So, and then I stumbled into the world of coaching. And my mentor and coach was the originator of business coaching in Europe, a guy, amazing guy called Graham Alexander. I wrote a book with him called Super Coaching. And coaching for me is it, it, that that has really landed the methodology and the system of working with people that resonates with who I am. So for me, I'm all about creating the conditions in the environments for people to discover their own truth, who they are, to unlock their potential. Coaching for me is the mechanism for do for doing that. And I do that in three ways. So leadership development, team development, personal coaching, and then I write. But my writing is a consolidation of my thinking and my experience. Brilliant. That was a lovely little swashbuckling ride through Ben Renshaw. In it, you you said something that provoked a thought, um, which is, it seems rather young when you came back to the United States, you decided that problem and people were your thing. And one of the things I certainly want to be talking about is when is it that people get their thing? It's been my observation that there are still many people my age coming on 60 who haven't got their thing really. What they did is they lived a life that was sort of premeditated for them and they oftentimes end up not feeling so hot or fulfilled because they just live someone else's life. And then when you're really young, you don't know what is your thing. You know, who am I? How are you supposed to know? So how did you at that young age fall into this idea of people and problem? I mean, did you, did you, are you, are you telling me a story that you retrofitted or you had this aha moment in a bathtub uh, when you arrived back in London? Yeah. Yeah, look, it's um, so if I, if I go into a little bit more depth on that, so I so growing up at the Yehudi Menuhin School was a remarkable environment because we had the best musicians in the world coming along and teaching us these maestros, and, and many of them were in their seventies, eighties, even their nineties, and literally. Some of them were unable to walk. They were unable, unable to move. They literally had to get carried to the piano or to put the violin under their chin. But when they did, they created magic. And so from a... Now, this is obviously retrospective. I, I didn't realize this at the time, but I grew up in an environment where um, people's lives were devoted, you know, to to the arts or to the expression of creativity and to, to outstanding performance. And I think that planted a seed in me that actually I, I realized very early on, I had no interest in work. Like the idea of having a job or having or working zero interest. I was very clear on that. Having a passion, having something I love, having a form of creative expression, I, I was very, that that was very clear for me. So as soon as I got put in a mechanistic environment, which was a music college where I was supposed to be on this performer's course, I just rebelled. I just fought back, and I literally almost had stand-up fights with my professors, who, in my opinion, were a total and utter waste of time in their mechanistic approach to learning and education. Soft edge. <laughs> and I'm an educationalist at heart, but for me, that's all about helping people to discover, again, you know, your own sense of learning and what is your truth and what is you. So I think that that was, and actually I've got to give my father a lot of credit because he, he went from being the head of the school actually to becoming a professor at the Guildhall. <laughs> and, and, but his 
the program he ran was very radical there. And it was all about helping people in terms of their free thinking and expression of their art. So I think that was a big influence for me. And so he was very supportive of me quitting the, the college and leaving music. But then on a personal note, I'd been through a major crisis in my own family. My parents divorced. It was very public. It was very painful. That really got me questioning. And at the age of 16, so this is over 40 years ago, I got introduced to meditation and Buddhism. And so that really started my questioning in terms of an introduction to different realms of consciousness and awareness and thinking. And, and I, so right from, again, as a teenager, I entered into the world of meditation and what's now called spirituality, but really challenging conventional thinking. So I've always you know, I think of myself, I'm unemployable. I wouldn't last a day in a job, but I partner with the, some of the biggest organizations in the world and really help create the conditions and the environments for people, you know, to discover their own sense of purpose and actually how can they be the best version of themselves in those environments, which really led me, you know, the, so writing love work with my uh, collaborator, Sophie Devonshire, that 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 book is absolutely the synopsis, you know, of 30 years of synthesis of what does it mean to love work? Firstly, what is work? How do you define it? How do you look at it? And what is a model and a system that takes you on a journey to really discover, develop, and then absolutely de deliver the work you love? So I have a couple more questions before we get into the book. I have several questions, of course, about that. But uh, one is you go to the States and you become the relationship guy. And I'm just wondering to what extent that was a reflection of the divorce son. Yeah, look, I mean, I've made you know, virtually every mistake you could make in life, you know, and that's all, you know, from personal experience and, uh, and, and without a question, my, the impact of, you know, my parents divorce, I mean, that destroyed me, destroyed my world at the time, put me in, in the world of therapy, et cetera, for, well, to this day. And, you know, done a lot of work on a personal level around, you know, family of origin and the impact on, on self and me and then obviously i'm a parent with three kids and the impact of that and i've been through a divorce so i you know i've got a lot of experience around trauma the impact of trauma and how that's influenced my work and what i do so i absolutely so everything i do is very number one personally driven because it it, it 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 for me i'm not a researcher i'm not an academic i'm not a theorist so i'm not going to come out with some thesis you know, everything I do and every provocation that I is absolutely born out of direct experience, what works, what doesn't work. And that's, you know, born out of 30 odd years of coaching senior leaders, developing leaders at every level in organizations. But also the driver for that is very personal for me and also as a parent. So, you know, I'm a passionate, I, I see my and my children are 21, 17, and 13. And I and actually I was having this conversation with my 17-year-old this weekend, who's doing A levels, and he's really developing his free thinking. And I just love it. And I say to him, look, the only thing I care about, I don't care about your grades. I don't care because he's questioning: do I go to uni? Do I do this? And I said, I have no, I, I, I don't care what you know what i care about is that you arrive at your own conclusions of what's right for you my suggestion is that keep your options open because you just don't know so like i said to him i started music college and i hated it and i quit i then got in to read psychology at university because i'm a good you know reasonable you know, communicator. I had terrible grades, but I could talk my way in. But before I started, I quit because I'm like, I'm not doing this. And then I landed up on my own path in America and forged my own, you know, journey. But that was what I went through. So I, and the great thing, I've only been ever been self-employed. So I can say to my kids, 
look, you know, that that's my journey. You will find your own way. And I'm just going to, he- I'm here for you every step of that journey. So I don't, I don't care what that looks like, what you do, what I care about is that you have really applied, you know, your own thinking and found your way. Well, that makes me want to move to another piece, which is the the challenge of having difficult conversations, which you address in the book. This is a, the book I'm writing about right now on, on conversation. And the the nature of this one is when you have a conversation with, let's say, a 17-year-old boy, your son, and, and you feel he's doing something wrong or could be better because, you know, you've had 30, 40 years more of experience. So I'm thinking about me as a father with my 26-year-old, 23-year-old or any parents. Anyway, the point is that this can be a topic or a subject, sorry, uh, and a relationship where things can quickly go a little ballistic because of the nature of the age gap and the long-termness of the relationship, hopefully bound by some confession of love underneath this. Yet, can it go horribly wrong? So I'm wondering how you manage when you have this moment where you're like, you know, um, I hate music. I hate all music, Father. He's not saying he hates music. He's saying something to you about you, for example, or, or something like that. How do you how do you manage those triggers or those moments? Um, yeah, look, it's, it's a great question. Um, look, I, I think that one of the one one of the areas that I feel very very strongly about is creating the conditions and the environment of obviously what's now called psychological safety. You know, I, I think that. I've I have spent most of my life uh, with fear and feeling afraid, and it's very very unhealthy. It's very destructive. It's very damaging. Uh, it, it it early in my career, uh, it it became very restrictive. You know of my ability to add value, make a difference. I was afraid of speaking up. I was afraid of having voice. I was afraid of having ideas of really contributing that. And so again, probably what holds me true in those scenarios when I'm challenging my own children is my absolute fundamental core belief that it's far more important that they feel safe and then they can come and disclose to me and have difficult conversations with me than what they do. Yeah, they're going to do what they do. And, it, you know, I've got very little, some influence over that, but very little. But where I do, where I really can make a difference is the environment that they have with me, which, again, is actually very, very similar to my work in organizations, where I have very little influence around organizational strategy and priorities and, you know, what what goes on, but where I can absolutely make a, a tangible difference is the quality of the environments that I enable and in order so that executives and teams at very senior levels can have conversations that they normally wouldn't have. And why? Because I create safety in the room. And I feel very, very strongly about that. Now I'm I'm very fortunate in the you know, the originator of psychological safety, Amy Edmondson, she sponsored my work and I'm very influenced by her methodology and approach. Um, but, but that has been something in my DNA uh, for a long time. Imagine how fast we could solve the world's biggest problems if more SaaS startups would gain traction sooner. Welcome to the Tech Entrepreneur on a Mission podcast. This podcast is dedicated to sharing experiences from B2B SaaS CEOs who are going above and beyond to deliver change that is noticed. You will hear their secrets and learn what is required to build a SaaS business that the world starts talking about and keeps talking about, and how to overcome the roadblocks to do so. So um, one of the areas that I know I'm personally not so hot at is knowing how to set boundaries, which of course are a, um, 
a big part of her work. How do you, how, how would you advise people to go around setting boundaries with hot topic individuals, if you will, where you know yeah. it can go a little ballistic? Yeah. So what's interesting? So I, 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 I draw, I always draw upon research to kind of validate my work, not my research, but others, because it's, I, I find it very helpful and people appreciate that. So as an example, uh, there's a, a body called the ADP Institute, which specializes engagement. And in 2019, they did a, a empirical piece of research interviewing 19,000 workers globally. It's headed up by Marcus Buckingham, who's the you know originator of strength. So it's got a lot of credibility supported by Harvard. Anyway, uh, what they found was uh, they they out of all their data, they basically said engagement translates as trust. And they found that there were 10, 10 key indicators that really impacted engagement. The number one, the first one was clarity of expectation. So the actual statement, so this is engagement organizations. The statement was, I clearly understand what's expected of me in my role. So for me, when I, I don't talk boundaries, but I do talk expectations and being very clear on expectations. What do I expect of you? What do you expect of me? My role, my responsibilities, my accountabilities, my objectives, my deliverables, my performance, however you want to translate that, clarity of expectation is key. So I will use that as a starting point for saying, here's the data. You want trust. The way that trans trust is translated, number one, is clarity of expectation. Because then I know the deal. I know what you expect of me. I know what you expect of me. Now, that's not only in terms of objectives and deliverables, but also in terms of ways of working. So obviously what I do when I'm working, particularly, say, with teams, is we do a big bit of work around ways of working. So what are the expectations here? You know, can we expect to have voice? Can we expect to give and receive feedback? Can we expect, you know, da -da -da. and then we document that. But I don't, and I, but I really challenge them. I say, look, something I, I live by in organizations is the rule of three. So what I notice a lot in companies, they, you know, they make everything very complicated. There's way too much stuff. You can't remember any of it. And I, I, I supported the president of Heinz in the UK, Dave Woodward, fantastic guy for many years. And he lived by this rule of three. So he only communicated in threes. And it works. And it's very memorable. So when I'm working with couple, we, we will synthesize expectations, rule of three, here are the three things. And then you review and you monitor that. And it just makes life easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing like that list of 10 things, is there? I mean, you, you get past three, and you're like, oh, I don't remember what the fourth one is. Um, yeah, well, I um what let's go into this notion of finding oneself. You you have at the very end, you have this wonderful quote from Benjamin Franklin, uh, which I have to find. Um he said, There, yeah, the three things that are hard in life, uh diamonds something and knowing uh, diamonds hard uh, steel and know yourself you write about uh, at the very beginning several individuals that uh, include in particular roger hunt who had this sort of life-changing moment in mumbai yeah. and um and what what he came out with that and it's certainly been my observation ben that a lot of people only get into this idea of know yourself in a more concrete, deeper way once they've had, as you write, that crucible moment. But it seems a shame to wait for the crucible moment. Yet, when you're young, I mean, unlike you, I, when I was young, I had no idea. And, and I think that for a lot of young people, what's your passion? What do you want to do in life? Who do you want to be? Hmm. I think a lot of people don't know. And, and then what could be the stimulus in between that don't know, don't passion, have had no experience? Because, you know, all you've done is gone to school. I mean, yeah, you're 20 years old. You might have done a gap year, but, you know, you still haven't done shit. And then observe what happened in Mumbai or, for me, 9-11. Those are those crucible moments. How do, you, how do you urge people to go through 
that, let's say, crucible moment in your mind without need to go through the crucible moment in your body. Yeah. Uh, yeah, look, thank you. And they're great references. So look, obviously for listeners, the, the Roger Hunt story was a remarkable um, story where I was um, running a leadership program for an organization and we use a lot of storytelling. And, and actually the process that we use is absolutely a way of accelerating that awareness and understanding about who you are without having to, you know, necessarily experience the, 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 you know, just human tragedy on, on such a major scale. But Roger Hunt, so he, at the time, he was an executive for the Royal Bank of Scotland and he was in Mumbai and he happened to be in the Oberoi hotel when there was a hostage siege. And uh, he's spent... been in that hotel, by the way. Yeah, no, I mean, and he spent three days uh, on the floor behind his sofa and wrote this extraordinary book called Be Silent or Be Killed. And he, there was something about his presence. I, I'd, I'd observed it over the 20, 48 hours of our training, but it wasn't until he shared his story that it, it made sense that literally, um, he and 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 you know he left the restaurant i mean it was extra he decided i'm not going to have a dessert i'm going to go to my room he walked out of the restaurant got in the lift as he got in the lift the host, you know the the attackers went in and killed everybody in the restaurant so he got to his room and he could hear the attackers on the floors going from floor to floor and it was in the day of the blackberry and luckily he had battery length and he was able to stay connected to the bank back in Scotland who were advising him. And so, yes, so that, that was the example there. And um, so the a, a way, a way of accelerating this, and actually this is a really proven uh, process because again, one of my clients, an HR director of a major company, she went to Harvard to their most popular leadership development program and they actually started the program with this exercise and it'll be i'm sure listeners will be familiar with it but it's called a timeline or a lifeline and what you do is imagine you you have a page and you put a line across the page and that represents your life below the line what you do is you record major events experiences that you've had that have been pivotal and really impacted your life step number one Step number two, you make you you reflect upon the meaning and the impact of those events and experiences for you, and then you derive the the value that you concluded as a result of that. Now, so quick example, you use me as an example, bring that to life. I'll give you three quick examples. So when I was eight, uh, my family moved from the north of England from Leeds to take over you know, the Udi menu in school. So that was the first event in my life that I remember, really significant. The impact of that for me was a loss of family because from the age of eight, my parents then ran this school with 45 kids and I never saw them. So the value I concluded as a result of that was the importance of love because that was the missing bit for me. Then at 16, um, I, uh, my, the, the event was the divorce, which I'd already mentioned. The impact of it, again, for me, was huge loss. And the value I concluded from that was the importance of honesty. And then the third event would be when I left school and I traveled and I experienced freedom, and that's a core value for me. So that's one bit. Then above the line, you begin to, so that you're looking at your values, and then above the line, you're looking at your sense of purpose. Now, purpose is linked to when you're at your best. Purpose is linked to when often it's described as being in flow or in the zone. Uh, when you're engaged in activity and you lose sense of time. And so then you look at what are those experiences that you have in life when you're at your best. So again, for me, that would be growing up was when I was playing sports, then again, traveling, and then writing. So they would be three events. Again, you need to make meaning of them. So for me, um, playing sports was about passion. Traveling for me is about learning, and writing is about creativity. And then you have you bring those themes together and you say, so what? <laughs> So what, what, what does that all mean for you 
Why is that important? Now, if that's done in a facilitated way with somebody that's experienced, genuinely in two hours, actually you can enable somebody to, to really move a long way in terms of their awareness and their articulation of their own sense of purpose. Now, I remember on one occasion, I, I was asked to run a program for high potentials in I used to do a lot of work in the in AMIA, so Asia, Middle East, Africa, and India. And I was very fortunate with a global company. I was very fortunate. And we were in Singapore and we had then next generation talent, which I have a passion for. And I had a big argument with the sponsor of the program who was I because I wanted to do this exercise. And these were individuals in their mid-20s, and the sponsor was going, No, they're too young, they haven't got life experience. You know, how would they know? And I that really provoked me. I'm like, we are, no, 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 no. We are, we are doing this. And I fundamentally disagree that at that age and stage in life, you may not have, you, you, you may not have the been through a conscious process, but you will have been through experience, which will be instrumental for you. And I'll give you one example that's still 20 years later is, you know, I can recall it, this extraordinary woman, mid-20s from India. And, you know, she shared how, you know, she grew up on a, on a convent, on this hilltop village, and she hated it, and she ran away and ran home, and her parents sent her back. And then she ran away to Mumbai, Coins oh, no, New Delhi, again, as a teenager with nothing and and she was so talented and she she put herself through school she missed getting by getting into the top university by one grade so she went back and she did it again and she qualified i mean her tenacity her determination her was just so humbling and then she went on to became this fast track leader in this organization she had no fear so the chair, and as an example, they had the chairman of the company come, everybody too afraid to speak to them. And, you know, this individual straight up to the chairman, engaging them, asking them questions. I mean, just extraordinary stuff. So I, I, I absolutely believe that at whatever stage and age of life, career experience, you can absolutely accelerate and be very intentional and be very deliberate about finding and understanding your key drivers, your deepest intrinsic motivations. And then with the right construct, you can then apply that, for instance, in terms of your work, your career, and make meaning of that. And you don't have to wait until you have some, you know, uh, extraordinary event happen, which then gets you to question. Right. Well, so I, part of me says, well, you still need to have had enough experience in your case up until you were 20, right? Where you had your, you were eight, oh, but you see, I, it, it depends. You see, I suppose even with experience, and look, this is just a point of view. So I'm not, I'm not here to, I have no interest in being right. Yeah. So my, in all my communications, and I always clarify this, I have zero interest in being right. What I am interested in is provoking curiosity. So for, as a parent, if you said to me as a parent that, you know, your teenage children, they don't have the, the wherewithal within them to be really curious about who they are and what that means and what that looks like and begin to follow their interest. Like my son of 13, he is absolutely passionate and obsessed with cooking. He wants to be a Japanese chef. End of story. Now, where that comes from, I have no idea. He's got no interest in going to university. He wants to go to Japan and, and, and become a, a, a sous chef, a Japanese chef. And so what I do is I engage him with that. And like last week, I take him to experiences, culinary experiences, where he witnesses that. I start in. I'm beginning to uh, introduce him to chefs because I'm fortunate. I'm, I've spent a lot of time in hospitality. I know a lot of people in that world. And he's 
and, and I'm absolutely meeting him where he's at. Now, on a personal note, you say to me, go be a chef. I couldn't think of anything worse. Yeah. Right. But but that is he. And at 13, he has enough awareness, energy, and passion, and creativity and curiosity to explore that channel. Wonderful. Go for it. Well, um, you write in the book, you say everyone has a purpose, finding purpose or passion. Um, when is it enough? Because the, my, the, my thinking goes this part. You know, like if I've had a, a very wonderful childhood and I uh, graduated top of my class, I go to university, I, I play the rugby team or whatever, and it's success, and I know how to play music even. And then I graduate and I get a job and I'm working at, uh, Goldman Sachs. It it feels like th there isn't any roughness to that experience, and I, and while there's always some kind of trauma, like well, my father wasn't there enough, or you know, I saw an accident, a car accident, you know, that there there are other things that are more or less tangible. But it it I, I, you know, I, I certainly don't feel like I have a right or wrong about it either. But I I think of so many people who haven't won't take that step to spend those two hours with Ben Renshaw to go through this timeline. Yeah. You know, look, it, it's a great point. And I mean, I it, when you when I listen to you, it almost makes me think about our current prime minister. I mean, Rishi Sunak, who's, you know, highly privileged, educated, Goldman Sachs, you oh. know, <laughs> ma married it, into ticks a few boxes. Yeah. You know, married into a billionaire's family. And you you got to ask yourself, what, what does he stand for? I mean, what is he about? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I really, I really want him to succeed. I appreciate the challenge of the role. But, you know, I, now I, I won't get into politics, but, but I, 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 I think that, in my again, just in my humble experience, it usually, you know, is a a, a major event that that gets people to step back. But 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 having said that, I I also absolutely and I have coached. I'm thinking of one CEO I coached who has had a very just a fortunate life. Yeah. And, you know, was an accountant and came from a very stable family, quite an artistic family, became an accountant, worked their way up to CFO, head of strategy, and then got a, was in the right time, right place, right time to be a successor for a CEO. And when I started coaching him, I was working in the organization. I was running a big program on purpose. He had very little interest, but because he was on succession and, um, and he'd had some feedback that it would be good to look at his emotional intelligence and his own sense of purpose. And we engaged on that level. Well, 18 months later, he became the next CEO. And his inaugural address was him sharing his personal story about his purpose. You, you never, ever predicted that. Never. And you know, so I, I've also had experiences of people that Again, that wasn't out of trauma. That wasn't out of tragedy. That was out of organizational need and succession for the top job. And he engaged with purpose and created, literally, we, we created a whole framework of being purpose-led as CEO. And he implemented that framework and he defined what did success look like? How would he know? What would that mean? He applied that to strategy, to people, to stakeholders. And he absolutely drilled himself on that. And as an accountant, you know, he had his dashboard and all the rest of it. So I've absolutely seen that in action as well. Mm. Well, let's talk about love a little bit. Um, you, you cite uh, Paul Snyder and the quote, which I like very much, that love is the most underused word in business. It seems to be incongruous that as human beings, we carve out eight to 10 hours a day to live in environments where love is supposed to be absent. And uh, I've had on my show a woman called Yetunde Hoffman, who wrote the book, The Value of Love-Based Leadership. I had a woman on my team 
uh, when I was running uh, Redkin Worldwide. Uh, and she was the unofficial director of love. So it's not a topic I'm unfamiliar with. Yet, I wonder how you define love in this case in work. Yeah. Look, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. And, and it's always been very much on my mind. I mean, about 15 years ago, I was working with Intercontinental Hotels Group. And they created a core purpose, great hotels, guest love. And they actually devised, uh, came up with a loveometer. So they they were really measuring, you know, guest love. So obviously move from guest satisfaction to guest love. So again, I, I have been in organizations over the years where love has been in the conversation. It's been in the way of how would we know and how do you measure? Um, I think that... Um, I was, you know, Sophie and myself and writing love work, we were very deliberate, again, in terms of provoking, not, oh, like work or tolerate work, but no, love work. And and so I, so what I, the starting point in, in most of my work is meaning. So create the condition for people to define what things mean. So, you know, me saying, what does love mean at work? I'm not so interested in that. What I'm interested in is, well, what do you mean? Do you have any interest in it? Do you want to love your work? Do you want to like your work? Do you want to tolerate it? Do you want to hate it? It's up to you. I mean, that's a choice. You know, you don't have to love your work. Personally, I couldn't imagine a day, if I didn't wake up every day loving my work, just, I, I, it, it's incomprehensible to me. I love my clients. Most of my clients I've worked with for over 20 years. I'm passionate. So for me, love translates as passion, as meaning, as care. I mean, I really, really care about my clients. I know about their lives. I know about their families. I know about their kids. I know about their bereavements. I know about, yeah, I, it's very, very personal. I got an email yesterday from the wife of a client I coached, a lawyer, 10 years ago, an email from his wife telling me that his father had died. I've never, I mean, I haven't corresponded with his wife. I've met her once, 10 years ago. They live in Australia. She took the time to notify me, and I left him a voicemail just acknowledging the loss of his father. And I got a text back just saying, thank you. And I went back. I said, you're a soul brother to me. You know, this is a hard-nosed lawyer that opened up the very first global law practice in Australasia. And our relationship is based on care, on friendship, on understanding, on compassion. That is me. Now, I'm not saying I'm not advocating that for anybody else. Personally, I couldn't imagine it. I couldn't imagine going through my work where it's just transaction, where it's just money, where it's just deliverables, you know, where it's just metrics. I mean, it's unthinkable. But I understand that that's other people's realities. I get it. Personally, I don't choose to spend environment in, you know, be in environments in those environments. But I I mean, today, I, you know, I'm I'm very fortunate. I work with a a construction program. They're building one of the biggest roads in this country. It's a 10 billion pound, you know, government program. It's big stuff. And we are having a very strategic conversation about purpose right now. And whether strategically they want to go down the road, apologies for that, but, you know, they're building a road. They want it to be the greenest road ever built in the world. And do they go down the road of position that as purpose? Well, presumably you're just going to, grow a lot of grass so you know it, it's so i you know i just share these examples they're them there for me so i would be encouraging anybody that listening that works is well what does it mean for you yeah right well i hear you and um of course the, the idea of measuring love is a, a hoot i i think that is uh, charming that uh, such thoughts are even considered I, I'm re I read about empathy a lot. And one of the things I regularly get asked is, how do you measure empathy? Which is 
possibly relevant in a concept of programming artificial intelligence, where you're trying to assess its ability as an engineer, I would say more than anything else, but such a, uh, so many of these human qualities like courage or, or confidence are, are not things you should be putting numbers to or love for that matter. So here's the thing. Then, Ben, when you talk to a client who you make them understand their what there's what's important to them, and you're like, "Well, what the hell are you doing at this job? How often does that happen? And then how do you handle that? Because at the end of the day, if you were to run this out and do that to a lot of people in in large organizations, you would have a lot of people flooding the exits, in my opinion. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's very interesting, and I understand that. It's actually not my experience, and 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 I feel I've, I'm very, very, very clear with clients on this. That number one, the grass isn't green. So you know, be, before thinking of you know quitting and uh, and before trying to you know think of changing your external reality, you have to have to focus on your internal reality. Most most people are miles away from having done the sufficient introspection to even understand where they are. What does that mean? What does that look like? Now, love work, you know, we the, the, there is the seven stages to that. And genuinely, if you'd have worked through that, you know, there's a discovery phase, a development stage. The final stage is delivery, is implementation. That's now genuinely subject to where you are, I would say it's minimum 12 to 18 months before you even get to any implementation with, with sufficient awareness and understanding what is your foundation, what's your infrastructure. Yeah. And, you know, I, so as examples, being so clear on your own sense of purpose and your values and how do you codify that and what does that mean and look like, really defining your, you know, work and what does success look like and what's the criteria for that really understanding you know your strengths and how do you play to your strengths and what does that mean and look like and uh, you know i could go on and on with these very very important elements that you need to work through and clarify before you even get to a decision about what choice to make and just to, on an example of that that lawyer who i just meant to um, uh, mentioned and why i'm so close so he, there he was running this extraordinary global practice the market soft and he was saying he was leading the market softened the firm wanted him to go back to practicing law he couldn't do another transaction he was done but it's challenging you know there he is he's got you know this incredible lifestyle lives under harbor bridge three kids still a little and he didn't know what to do so what actually emerged out of that was what he called a decision-making framework and he identified 10 critical questions for him to reflect upon. We spent 18 months looking at those questions. What is my purpose? Who do I want to spend time with? Yeah, what's really meaningful for me? Uh, how, you know, what, what are my financial drivers? Um, what do I want to contribute to society? Did a look. And then we then looked at options. You know, do you, do you stay as a lawyer? Do you leave? Do, and it was very interesting. His final, final option was to become an entrepreneur because as a lawyer, very risk averse. What actually emerged out of those 80 months was he then set up a company with a former CFO, a mate of his, um, which was called something like um, Purpose and Profit. And they set, set up a social ethical investment fund out of that they then bought a dairy for a few million and then seven years later where he's now that that dairy is worth tens of millions you'd never have predicted any of it so I, and that's just one example i could give you multiple examples of people that have been through that very introspective reflective journey out of that they've arrived at places they would never have predicted and that's not just on that's not just on age one quick note just in covid the son of a of a client of mine because i'm passionate about next generation 
And he was in recruitment. He then found another opportunity. So he resigned, went to this other company. But just as COVID hit, that company then didn't take him on. He couldn't go back to his old company, so he was unemployed. So he called me up in crisis. I coached him for a year during COVID. He landed up in technology, and he went through all of this, and I write about him in Love Work. And he is now flying in. In fact, he's now in the field of customer success, got another role last week, reached out to me again with an update. You you couldn't have predicted any of it, but he was committed to doing that introspection. Well, so, and he's 25 years old. So again, I can give you all at all spectrums of age, stage of career, hierarchy, all of that good stuff. Well, no, I totally appreciate that. Ben, and uh, and for having been through such a journey myself with my company, I, I completely understand all of these things. Yet, if I were the chairman of that company in the chairman of the board, I don't know if your friend was also chairman, but and, and I say Ben Renshaw is coming. Fuck, you know, he's gonna he's gonna get everyone to scram. Look at this guy, he becomes a dairy farmer. So what advice do you give yeah. to a C you see what I'm saying? What advice do you give to people who are running organizations that you want and they want to align their values and purpose to create a workplace that fosters a sense of love and fulfillment? How do you how do you get over that uh, hump where everyone's running for the, you know, bloody another raison d'etre written on a wall? Ha. Huh. Yeah. So look, I mean, strategically, my agenda usually sits under great place to work. So, you know, in, in terms of an organizational strategy, however you define it, it's the people agenda. Now, the number one, number one uh, criteria I would suggest, you know, to create a great place to work is learning and development. You, know, you, you If you're not growing people, you will not grow as a company. End of story. You cannot... You cannot have just, and most organizations I work with, it's a growth strategy. They want to grow, double the business, five to 10 billion or whatever it is. Yeah, great. But in order to do that, you got to grow in people. Including the CEO, by the way, right? Yeah, absolutely, which is the level I operate at. And so with that in mind, then you're looking at learning and development. You're looking at succession and future talent. That is critical. And if organizations don't do that, they are totally at risk. Now, there's the risk of development is, yeah, some people may go, this isn't for me. But then from an organizational perspective, do you want to have a whole bunch of employees who are the wrong fit for the company? No, which is basically the case you're, today. I mean, well, 70% of employees. You're, you're, well, no, you're, says- you're, too, you're too extreme for me. I would suggest my humble view, working with organizations all over the world, that wrong fit is probably about 10%. Well, what I meant, or let, if I finish, is that there's studies uh, from Harvard that show that 70% of employees are not engaged at work. Okay. Now, so thank you. So when we're talking about engagement, that is different because I would suggest by investing in people's learning and development, part of the rationale for that is to drive engagement. And the companies that are not afraid. So I work with companies, they're very, very clear they that they absolutely advocate for employees that in terms of what they call good leavers yeah you you want to leave that is great we will support you with that obviously with the intent that you could come back that we don't want to hold you here we don't want to restrain you mm-hmm. and i think enlightened companies recognize today that absolutely that it's fantastic go off get some new experience but come back and if you've got the confidence and the the, the the belief in you as a company that you are that brilliant an employer, people will not only will they be great advocates of you as a company, they 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 will spread the word. They will, you want to go and work here? Why? Because they invest in you, they believe in you, they champion you. you. You're free to come and go, and we are you know the the and for me that's very much the type of future organization, the really kind of mechanistic companies that are fear-based, that are, oh, you know, we're terrified of our talent leaving. You you will not survive into the future. Well, it's like Sting said, you know, I suppose if you love somebody, set them free. Absolutely. Brilliant. <laughs> ben, well, thank you for a very impassioned um, podcast. 
great to have you on the show. Um, I'm great friends with Sophie and I've had her on the show already. Uh, how how can someone track you down, hire you, read up what you're up to, uh, get your new books? I know you've got a new book, How to Be a CEO, coming out. Yeah, look, thank you. But look, the easiest way is just, you know, go to benrencher.com or please just link in on LinkedIn. That's my favorite tool for that is the easiest way. And I'm, I'm, you know, I, I love conversation as you know, and really appreciate your time and your questions and your interest. So uh, love work it out. How to be a CEO will be out in September, but the easiest way is just keep in touch with Ben Renshaw. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show, would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash interdial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on minterdial.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish... Here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger to feel Trust is a reason, still I won't tell the lie. I sit here passively, hope for your respect, anticipating the thrill of your intellect. Maybe I tell myself there's no use in me lying. I'm a convinced man building an urge. I'm a convinced man. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man, challenge my fate. I'm a convinced man, competitions innate. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. Despise revenges and struggles. Live for the challenge so life's not incomplete What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me Precipitating the danger to feel free Trust in my reason and let me show you why I'm a convinced man practicing my lines I'm a convinced man here in these confines A convinced man in the arms of a woman I'm a convinced man me to the test I'm a convinced man I'm ready for an arrest I'm a
I don't kill anybody and I'm not a thug, but you know, it just always stuck with me. So when I have my skates on, that's my identity is kill a thug. I love it. <laughs> Interesting. Jim's roller derby name <laughs> is light banter. Yes. That's very threatening. It I is. wouldn't want to go head to head with you. You should no. see yeah. him skate in circles around <laughs> the other girls. Ever want to learn how to write a hit song? Or stop procrastinating? Or even use Brazilian jiu-jitsu in life? Thoughts That Rock is the how-to podcast that delivers the juice.